Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this really special event here on Zoom, but also on the YouTube live stream. We have the pleasure of being able to offer a live viewing of the documentary Rhino People, which was funded by National Geographic under their call, Making the Case for Nature. And this will be followed by a discussion with Professor Hearn, Dr. Eason, Dr. Marks, Dr. Badman King, and Dr. Mitchell, who are the researchers, as well as the filmmaker, of course, who created this incredible documentary. So please make yourself comfortable, grab some tea or a snack if you'd like, and I hope that you enjoy this event. My name is Diama Dwarda. I'm a PhD candidate in anthrozoology at the University of Exeter, and I will be moderating this event as part of the Animals and Biodiversity Think Tank program. And it is hosted by the Global Research Network with the support and assistance, of course, of the other lovely junior fellows, some of whom are here today, such as Pablo, as well as the associate members who have really helped incredibly in the promotion of this event, especially Rebecca, who is also helping to ensure everything runs smoothly today. So a big thank you to all of them and everyone else working really hard to make this happen at the Global Research Network. They really are a fantastic team and organization to work together with. If you have any questions at all, please do write them down in the chat and they will be addressed following the documentary. Um, this event is being recorded and will be made public on the Global Research Network's YouTube channel, where it is currently being live streamed along with all of the previous wonderful events on a very wide range of topics. So if you would not like to appear on the recording, please turn off your camera and please also do double check to ensure that you are muted at all times, um, unless of course asked to unmute later on to formulate a question or response during the discussion. Um, and I, yeah, I would like to thank Professor Hearn, Dr. Mitchell, Dr. Eason, Dr. Benman King, and Dr. Marks for being here today to take the time to share this film and to share your insight into the, the research itself really with us to hopefully spread and strengthen awareness concerning both rhinos and those who uh, care for them. And with that, I will give the floor to Professor Hearn to introduce this wonderful documentary and its mission before we begin the viewing. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Timat, for such a lovely introduction. And um, thank you, everyone who's been involved in making this possible. And also for everyone, uh, we're really grateful to everyone who's come along to watch the film and to uh, talk to us about it. So as Tiamat said, um, the project was funded by National Geographic under their call Making the Case for Nature. Um, all of the members of the project team uh, and they'll all introduce themselves individually in a moment, but we all have um, anthropological backgrounds to varying degrees. And um, the Making the Case for Nature call um, was particularly concerned with trying to find novel ways of communicating science-based information about conservation. And so the project was a response to that particular call. And I'll just give a little bit of background about the the, why we chose to focus on the rhino poaching issue in particular, and then the theoretical underpinnings of the project. And then after we viewed the film, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the follow-up research that we've done since the film's been made, where we've done screenings with uh, different groups to assess the potential impact of this novel approach to, uh, to kind of anthropological uh, film and, and activist orientated filmmaking. So uh, some of you may know South Africa is home to 93% of the world's population of um, southern white rhinoceros and 40% of the critically endangered black rhinoceros. And between 2007 and 2014, there was a staggering 9,000% increase in rhino poaching across the country. In 2017, 1,028 rhinos were poached across South Africa. And this was the culmination of a decade during which 7,245 rhinos across Africa had been lost to poaching. So in response to this, in 2012, the South African government declared a state of crisis, which to date shows no signs of abating. And uh, researchers who have focused on the trade in uh, endangered wild animal parts um, have argued that as wildlife products such as rhino horn become rarer, their prices soar, and this pushes them even further into an economic supply and demand extinction vortex where that pressure is put on, um, on, in this case, in relation to the rhinos, pressures put on poachers to go to often quite extreme lengths to secure 
um, rhino horn for the consumer market. So according to the IUCN, there are now fewer than 30,000 rhinos left in the world. <clears throat> so there's, um, there's been lots of research done looking at the consumer market for rhino horn products. Um, across Asia, um, rhino horn has traditionally held immense value as a panacea. And this keratin-based substance has traditionally been ground into a powder to be ingested by consumers. Um, and in other parts of the world, in Yemen, for example, it can be used for um, ceremonial artifacts like dagger handles. And although this is no longer considered a significant market. Um, so in relation to the most recent research, um, Vietnam has been identified as the primary consumer base for rhino horn, um, but equally, as, as we'll see um, in the course of the, the discussion, that uh, the, the consumers are, are very varied. So Millikan and Shaw, in their uh, kind of widely uh, cited work on rhino horn consumers, identified four main groups of consumers, um, seriously or patients, affluent users who believe that it improves their health, upper or uh, sorry, middle or upper income parents who use it as a panacea to safeguard the health of their children, and people who use rhino horn to establish social or political advantage or prestige. And there's also evidence to suggest that while people across the gender and class spectrum do consume rhino horn, current users are predominantly wealthy older males. But the wildlife trade specialists traffic profiled the typical rhino horn consumer as a wealthy businessman in his 40s who wants to show rhino horn off to demonstrate his status. However, Millikan and Shaw also found that in Vietnam in particular, the substance has become a designer drug and is often snorted or mixed with alcohol by young partygoers. And so this is really uh, what, where our interest in developing this project um, kind of was peaked. So the recognition that young people represent a growing segment of the market is really important in terms of attempting to change future trends in consumer behavior. And so, as I said, this was the primary motivation behind the conception of this particular project. So the overarching aim of our research um, has been to explore, well, firstly, we, we wanted to create um, a film or a series of films, which we're going to be viewing today, but we wanted to use these films to then explore the, and assess the responses of international university students, and in particular those who originated from countries where rhino horn consumption has been documented and, and is associated as a traditional practice, and who therefore potentially represent or have access to this emerging consumer group. And so we wanted to create a novel approach to advocacy film, which combined ethnographic filmmaking techniques that are traditionally used by anthropologists underpinned by several diverse theoretical frameworks. And so we sought to engage viewers with the plight of rhinos in South Africa through narratives of and interviews with people who've dedicated their lives to caring for rhinos on the front line of this poaching crisis, but as also through documenting the experiences of surviving rhinos. So your rhino people um, comprises a, a triptych of three short films, and these were uh, based on ethnographic fieldwork that members of the team conducted in South Africa. Um, and this triptych was screened earlier this year at the Crosscuts International Film Festival in Stockholm, which is an environmental humanities film festival. And the three films are Bella's Story, which is about an individual rhino, Bella, and her carers, as well as Bella's calf, Tank, who was orphaned after Bella's death at the hands of poachers. The second film, Babies, which focused on the bereavements and grief of orphan baby rhinos at the Zululand Rhino Orphanage. And then finally, the care provide uh, um, the Guardians, which focused on different security patrols and paramilitary groups tasked with protecting rhinos, including the Black Mambas, which is an all-female anti-poaching unit. So each of these films takes a slightly different approach to engaging the viewer with the plight of rhinos, but they're all united by the theoretical underpinnings of what Tom Van Doren, the environmental humanities scholar, termed storied mourning. So storied mourning suggests a means by which humans might be encouraged to face and respond to the loss of life characteristic of the global environmental crisis. 
So through detailed accounts of the lives and deaths of individual rhinos in this case, from the people who knew them and cared for them, our use of storied mourning builds on Van Doren's work, which has been very text-based. And this is a quote from Van Doren, offers us the possibility of mourning as a deliberate act of sustained remembrance. So Van Doren cites the philosopher Thomas Attig's conception of grieving as, quote, a process of relearning the world. He says, as we grieve, we appropriate new understandings of the world and ourselves in it. We transform habits, motivations and behaviours, end quote. So consequently, through employing storied mourning um, as a form of bearing witness or what might be termed, we hope to catalyse what might be termed vicarious grief, which is defined as the spontaneous experience of sorrow for a loss suffered by another person. And we're hoping that through this novel use of these theoretical concepts in, in, in practice, in the way that we've put the films together and, uh, and documented the lives and deaths of rhinos, that we might be able to then facilitate some affective encounter with the potential to initiate hopefully profound changes in viewers' perceptions and behaviours. So I won't say any more about it now, but um, we'll talk a little bit more about the, the kind of the, the process of putting the film together and the, the way that viewers from international student bodies have responded to the film screenings that we've done afterwards. But um, in terms of backgrounds, because I think we'll all just briefly introduce ourselves. So my background is in anthropology, but um, more recently I've I've kind of taken on the mantle of an anthrozoologist. So I specialize in trans species and particularly human interactions with other animals in a wide range of different contexts. And um, yeah, and so my anthropological background means that I'm often interested in uh, kind of looking at the influence of culture, but also the influence of individual experience when it comes to shaping or informing how uh, people, humans interact with or perceive other animals. Um, so yeah, that's, that's me. Thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Hearn. Um, Dr. Marks, did you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm Kate Marks. My background is in anthrozoology. I completed a PhD in anthrozoology in 2018 at Exeter with Sam and with the um, EASE team. Um, my interests have always been, uh, again, in human and animal interactions, but particularly as well um, in human behavior change around animals and environmental behaviors. So my job at the moment um, is to take social research and insights uh, into segments of people and use those to create really compelling and persuasive campaigns on behalf of wildlife. Um, and so that really started with this project, I think, um, by spending time looking at behavior change models and theories uh, to compare our storied morning idea with. Um, that was really kind of the beginning of that interest. So uh, yeah, that's me. Shall I pass over to Andrew? Yeah, hi, thanks for that. Um, so my background is uh, I'm a social anthropologist. I'm based at Stockholm University. Uh, I teach uh, several courses there as well and as a researcher. Um, my research interests are mainly human-animal relations and science and technology studies, as well as material culture. Uh, I have quite a broad range of interests as well. Uh, natural science often comes into it. Um, I was working in the film business for many, many years as a camera operator, director of photography and still photographer uh, before returning to the academy uh, to uh, conduct higher education. Um, and uh, yeah, so I use visual methods as part of my research process, uh, as well as participant observation in the traditional sense. Uh, and in terms of the role of the film, I'm the co-director with uh, Kate and also the camera operator and editor as well. Um, I think that sums it up, to be honest, but yeah, thank you. Can I join you now? 
<laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Uh, I did my MA in anthrozoology with Professor Hearn in Wales, and then was very fortunate to go to Exeter and do my PhD in anthrozoology there. Uh, I'm now associate lecturer with the EASE group and personal tutor to our MA students. I've got a background in counselling psychology and I'm interested in, well, I've worked and volunteered for over 10 years with human and pet loss. So I'm interested in grief and the emotions that go with it. And I was interested how emotion affected all the people that we spoke to in game reserves uh, from every different background and level of work. So yeah, we had a very interesting time. Thanks very much. Thanks so much for the introductions. Um, Dr. Babin King, would you like to introduce yourself as well or would you, am I putting you on the spot by asking that? <laughs> No, I, I can say a, a little something if you'd, if you'd like. I um, Yeah, my background is, I suppose, largely as an ethicist um, in philosophy. Um, and uh, my part in this project, I'm, I think I was, I was particularly active in the devising stage at the beginning. And uh, I'm particularly interested in... Uh, well, all sorts of things in terms of the ethics of the project, but particularly in the nature of persuasion um, and the ethics of persuasion and coercion and the ways in which conversations can sometimes turn to ideas of uh, cultural relativism, of the ways in which different groups are treated, uh, the uh, equation of suffering of rhinos and the importance of other people involved, um, and uh, yeah, broadly speaking, whether it's right or wrong to present information in the way that we're doing it uh, in order to get people to think a certain way. Great, thanks so much for, for that. I always find it great to hear how creators of the film are, of course, researchers in this case are, are situated. So I think that, that adds a, um, a great element to now watch the documentary. So we'll get that shared on the screen. And um, while Rebecca very kindly sets that up <laughs> for all of us, if anyone, if you, you know, while you're watching the documentary, if you have any questions at all, you can write them in the chat and um, we'll get to that after. We'll have a bit more of an in-depth discussion about what we're about to view. So I hope that you enjoy it. Thank you, uh, Tiamat, can I just um, uh, give a trigger warning? Uh, oh, there is a written trigger warning on the screen, but Obviously, a film about rhino poaching is going to be emotive, and there are some scenes and some uh, narratives that viewers might find distressing. So, um, apologies in advance for that. But equally, it is kind of part of the part of the, the 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 rationale for the project is to try and catalyze some kind of emotional reaction in viewers. Uh, but yeah, as the part of as Alex said, part of his role is to to kind of think through the ethics of of that. Um, and again, that's something we'd be really happy to discuss during the Q&A session at the end. So, thanks. Oh, and equally, um, the, the audio doesn't kick in until um, a bit later in the film. So do make sure you've got your audio turned up because the, uh, the audio at the beginning is, is really important to, to the kind of the narrative of the film. So, thank you.
Alright, my boy, it's okay. Sorry, my boy. Okay. It's okay, my boy. She came to us as two years old from the Shishalum Falozi Game Reserve um, along with a young bull that we got at the same time. Um, at, you know, being that young they only really start breeding when they're six or seven years old so she surprised us one morning with a calf. We, we had no idea that you know, it was that it reached that point. Um, she was an amazing, we had her for 20 years so she was just such a beautiful rhino. Um, well, actually, she was 20 years old, I think, yeah, when she was poached. So, I mean, very much a part of the family, you can say. I mean, they don't know you exist, but because they're so much a part of your life, it's, you feel like they're part of your family. She, she had a soft heart, a big heart and just a beautiful rhino. Father-in-law phoned me and he said, how many rhino have we got again? And I said, well, so many. He says, no, ma'am, there's another pair of ears here with Bella. So I grabbed my camera because we were expecting her to calf and raced up there and there was this brand new little calf. It hadn't even stood up yet. It was still attached to the afterbirth and it was just amazing. So and I just managed to photograph everything. It was so lovely. Yeah, that female rhino is very special. Really special. You stress about the, the remainder rhinos you have. You know, you think, you know, how many times can a person go through something like this? Because as silly as it sounds, <laughs> um, I lost both my parents a couple of years ago, but that emotion, that raw emotion that one goes through, I had that same feeling when Bella died. It's hey, my girl. Hey. Hey, my girl. Seeing what a human can actually do to a beautiful animal like that, um, you know, so my feelings towards people have changed. Um, and, you know, with the rhinos as well, as much as when I work with them on a daily basis, I just want to like grab them, put them in my pocket and take them home. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, you know, you feel more, you have to protect them more somehow. So, yeah. Sadly, when I've seen them at their most vulnerable, when they become injured, um, often by poachers, uh, you know, that the torment that they go through, the pain is very visible. Uh, it's a very tangible uh, emotion that they are suffering and that they are in pain and that affects us enormously. We just buried her there, yeah. Yeah, we had to cut her up completely. Literally like cut her legs off of her body and just to get because the bullet went through her whole body, through the lungs, and then lodged in the ribs on the other side. And even in the metal detector, we just couldn't find it. So we really had to get in there to, to find it, you know? Yeah, shame. Yeah. The most horrific injuries. Um, and I think what the world needs to understand is that poaching is not hunting. It's not the objective is not to put an animal out of its misery or to kill it quickly. The objective is to get the horn off uh, at whatever cost that comes. And poachers have to do that in a way that is as quiet and as possible. So often they will only shoot an animal once. Um, and if it's lying there uh, injured or dying, they don't care about putting it out of its misery. They don't care about ending the pain and the suffering. All they care about is hacking that horn off as quick as possible. 
So this is the skull from a, a young male rhino who was the victim of a really horrible poaching where he had his horns hacked off while he was still awake. Um, I think they used uh, uh, darting drugs like, like vets would. Um, and while they anaesthetised, they hacked the horns off and leave them to wake up to that pain. So rather um, shockingly, you can actually see on here, these marks here, this isn't the normal shape of this area. Um, when you compare it to other skulls, you wouldn't be able to see through here. This, this bone would carry on all the way down. So this damage, um, a large amount of this has been done by a panga type weapon um, that's just come down with a large amount of force in order to go through this, this all the skin and the skull in order for the uh, poachers to get his horn off and then leave him to, to wake up to that pain. Last year, we dehorned them again, just to trim the horns like a normal procedure. Um, and a week later, she was, she was poached. And that, for me, was the hardest post-mortem that I've ever gone to. Just realizing that that was my first rhino, and my first rhino experience ever was with her. And now I'm sitting here, sifting through her organs, trying to find a body, a uh, bullet, which was heartbreaking actually for me. When you dehorn them, you feel like you've got a little bit of breathing space, you know. So it was n definitely not something we expected at all. Um, it was just so unreal to know that you've done basically for us the best we could do for her and then that wasn't enough which really hit it home as to that it's just a matter of when, not if. They, they're going to come and, you know, all we can do is be a deterrent and, you know, do our best, but at the end of the day, we're not a match for these guys. These people that look after Rana become very proud of the fact that, that they can take care of them. And when that tragedy hits, when they get poached, you know, it becomes a very, uh, uh, it's, it's like losing a member of the family for one, but it, that shame that I think people feel that we thought we were doing enough, we thought we had done what was required to stop poachers from taking their lives, and yet um, now we know it wasn't enough. You know? uh, and, and that's a traumatic thing for someone to go through who loves and cares for these animals to, to realize that their best was not good enough. Um, and I think that's, that's something that you can never get away from. You know, that will haunt um, us. We've had Rana Poach and Rana Rivers. It will haunt us for the rest of our lives. We thought we had it covered and we did. So the day of the Poach that night, um, we were obviously keeping a close eye on Tank especially. And um, I found him crying. It was just oh, pitiful. And I recorded it, and that went hugely viral because, I mean, you can just see this youngster, you know, he's, he's so confused. I mean, what the hell? <laughs> Sorry. So, yeah, it's, it's our 24-7, this is our lives. So they give us a lot of joy, but it's a constant worry, that's for sure. Sorry. All right, my boy. It's okay. Sorry, my boy. Okay. It's okay, my boy. Hey babies! Hey! Come on! Come on! 
they are gentle, emotional, um, very loving um, animals. Um, you know, they live in family groups. They live with other animals. Um, interaction is, is huge for them. They're not solitary animals. They get happy, they get excited. You know, all of our emotions, um, they display in one way or another. So I think it's, it just brings them closer to us and maybe when it brings them closer to us, it helps us understand them a little bit more. Little Banoi, he's almost five months old. His mother was poached. So um, we were quite lucky that he was found the same evening when poachers actually came in and shot his mom. Um, what happened was he was obviously with his mom and when they shot her and they were hacking her horns off, he was trying to chase the poachers away, trying to defend his mom. And they actually took an ax and they started hacking at him. So you can see he's got scars on his back, scars behind his ears, a uh, scar on his forehead um, from the poachers sort of trying to, to get him away from his mom. Um, and thank, thank God, you know, they didn't, um, they didn't actually kill him. What they normally do in a situation like that is they try and um, they go for the back, the spinal cord, so that they actually paralyze them. So sometimes you'll find little calves like that, that they don't actually kill them, they're just left paralyzed next to their mom. You can imagine if your mom is now hacked up by poachers, that image of a human is, it's just terrifying. So now we come in and we want to help him, feed him, um, treat his wounds, but he sees us as the enemy. So it took us, it took us a week to get him to, to drink milk from us, not that he even trusted us, um, he was extremely traumatized, um, crying in his sleep. So it was nonstop crying for about three days, just like pining for mom, not sure who we were, what we were trying to do, untrusting, um, charging us. So it was hard to get to him to treat his wounds. Um, so, you know, that's where our job is, is so important, um, where we can spend hours and hours patiently just sitting and hoping eventually they'll trust us and that we can then can work with them get to them but we were lucky that we had Kula who's still being bottle fed and he's very trusting so we actually decided okay we're gonna back off um, we're gonna introduce the two of them because he showed interest in little Kula and we're gonna let him bond with Kula and then learn from Kula that we are not the enemy and it worked, as you can see, it worked beautifully. Um, they accepted each other immediately. They, they're very much like people. They decide who they like and who they don't like. Um, these two bonded beautifully. And slowly, you know, Kula would come up to us and get his milk. And then Bonoy would realize, okay, well, this is actually, you know, it's not so bad. We can trust these people. Um, and now, you, you know, we look at them now, you know, they totally comfortable with us. He's very happy in his environment. He's got a mate um, and I think a, a big thing with them at that age is the body contact and physical contact either from us so with Kula, Kula accepted us and we were that for him with Banoi, Kula is now that for him so if you think of a calf in the wild with its mom they are right on top of mom all the time always looking for a little bit of okay I'm still here um, so you'll see Kula will walk up to me, I'll touch him and then he'll carry on. Whereas Banoi now does that with Kula. He'll go up to Kula, see, okay, he's still here. You know, so he's taken Kula as his motherly figure and Kula gets that from us. Come on! <coughs> when you look at a rhino, you see this tank of an animal, strong, sturdy, you know, um, big horn and um, hard, thick skin, and that sort of, uh, well, me anyway, that's what I thought, okay, well, surely that's what they look like, that's my, they must have Come that on. as a personality. 
Um, not at all. <laughs> they are gentle, emotional, um, very loving um, animals. Um, you know, they live in family groups. They have full-on conversations with each other. They're very, very vocal animals. Um, I think that's something that people don't realize about them. When you see them in the wild, you don't necessarily hear that. Um, they're these massive animals, and yet they have this high-pitched squeak um, that they use to communicate, whether they're two days old or 20 years old. You know, it, that sound doesn't change. It's um, uh, very high-pitched, and it's, it's really cute. <laughs> But they definitely talk and they talk to each other. They talk to us. Um, they let us know when they're hungry, especially the babies. They get super excited when it's milk time, so you hear them squeaking quite a lot. Oh, hello! Hello! It's Beastie Boys! Yum! Finished! Is it delicious? They know the timing. At 7, they know that oh, Jabu will come out from her room to look at us and then to let us out so that we were free on that big boma. They know the timing. Even if I call them at 4, oh, please come. They can come in and they know that oh, if Jabu is. is calling us, Jabu will give us food. We've got fresh food, fresh water every day. We will never let it get to a point where um, we can't bring Rano back. There are enough of us to protect, um, even if it's the last 200 remaining Rhino. Um, and that makes me, that makes me want to work harder and, and and recruit more people to our side and say, yes, it is a negative thing. And yes, it's, you know, we talk about all these negative statistics, but there is still um, this team of people that say, absolutely not. We will not let it happen. And we will continue fighting no matter, no matter the odds, um, no matter what's against us. And I'm very proud to be one of those those people that you know I'm not going to stand back and say oh well we've we've lost we've lost the battle um, every rhino counts every life counts and if I can protect ten of those lives out of however many you know if each person does does their bit um, I think it's a fight worth fighting for and I think we can win it um, not I think I know and we will yeah but I've been worrying before but now. They have dehorned, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you have tight securities. So we have got cameras. We have got security. We are safe, me and my family. Your rhino family. Yeah, well. <laughs> <That's> so lovely. <laughs> must expect anything, understand? Anything can happen. Someone can come and shoot you, someone can come and maybe he or she is passing, maybe a snake and a spider, anything can happen. But for me, it's like, I, I don't care whether someone comes or what, I am going to do to make sure that I save this animal. That's my job. The only target is to save these animals. I don't care whether you are my father, my brother, my sister, my uncle, my cousin, my friend, whatever, or it's a god, whatever. I'm going to do the same story. That's why how I, I love this job. It's, it's in my blood. My love, it's built by, you know, it's blood of rhino. 
love I love this animals very much. To become a black mamba, you need to be a strong woman. You need to be caring and you need to you know, be, to be somebody who is patient. You need to have love of nature, a woman who knows what you want in life and also keep on pushing and motivate other people to, uh, before you get what you want, never give up. Before you become a, a black member, never give up. You need to keep on pushing until you achieve your goals and also be a person who loves animals. Because without uh, the love of nature or animals, then you won't make it because you will just be waiting for money. Yes, we are waiting for money to, to support ourselves and our families, but we also need to love the animals and protect them. It's a lifestyle choice, more than it is a job, and it's a calling. Mm -hmm. Once you've seen the impact of people coming in and, and hacking off the face of a rhino, seeing that rhino kick a circle 40, 50 meters wide with blood streaming out of its face, busy suffocating on its own blood, once you remove the horn, they often expose the nasal cavity, which the horns are like a nail, it's got a, it's got a nail base, so it bleeds like a stuck pig once you've cut it. And often that's how rhinos go, they suffocate in their own blood while struggling in a, in a huge circle. And once you've seen that, it, it does kind of change you, and it does change your view on it. The first case of poaching in, at, at Shumwari was in 2008. It was December 2008, and I can remember the incident very well. I was working at, I was at the airport at Kigali and Rwanda, Central Africa. And John Brown, our colleagues, phoned me and he said we lost a rhino due to poaching. And, and, and we had an anti poaching team, but we, at the time, we had no cases, so uh, we were not all that alert. And I can still remember when I got back, uh, my colleague was doing the, uh, the, the necropsy, the post mortem examination, and this specific animal was shot in the, in the throat, it was shot through the bullet went through the jugular, through the trachea, and as far as he ran, the blood was just coming from the nose, and he died, a big, huge bull. And at those days, we had few rhinos, so we knew the individual cases. And this specific rhino grew up as a bull. We all knew him, and he was the dominant bull at the time. And, and, and when I got to him, I can still remember the emotions. In, the, in one case, I was quite sad about it, but we had no idea what was to follow. That was, we thought, one, perhaps one single incident. And then there was just more and more cases around us. We later, in 2011, we lost two more. And then we also had a case of armed robbery where the, the, the guys were after, after a rhino horn that we didn't, didn't have. But that was quite a traumatic experience. Yeah, after, when I was working for Dr. William Falls, we, we had to respond to a rhino that was poached. Uh, it, yeah, it was in a pretty sight. Uh, we got there, this animal was still alive like half the face was hacked off and he couldn't, he couldn't even walk. I think from lying down, like his, his legs were weak and he kept on like leaning on his face. Uh, so that, that broke me when I saw that. Like I had to do something. I had to, to get involved in this fight. So. I was born on this reserve actually. So I grew up here and always had a passion for conservation. First time in an helicopter, I was hooked. Uh, I, all I wanted to do was to fly. And then I was afforded an opportunity to do that. So it took me a while to, to, to finish my license because it's quite an expensive course. And when I, when I was finished, then there was an opportunity here because they had a plane, they didn't have a pilot. So it was a no-brainer for me. Like back home, I get to do conservation and I get to fly at the same time. We are here to, to conserve uh, the nature. We are here to make sure that the poachers doesn't kill our wildlife. That's why we do early detection, to make sure that when we see tracks of the poachers, we report them immediately and find out if uh, have they killed the rhino or not. And we very much are working fast to make sure that they mustn't kill the rhino. Even if they're inside, we need to push them out of the reserve before they kill the rhino. So that's why the black members are the eyes and ears of the reserve. Because it's all about gathering information and give it to the right people who can go down and face the poachers as we are unarmed, we don't do that. We do night patrol every day and in the morning also at 6 o'clock we woke up and check the fence. 
until nine. Yes. This is our regular job that we are doing every day, night and day. My parents they are also working inside the reserve. So when I was young, uh, I used to visit here, and my father would always take me to the game drive. So I was enjoying, and I was telling him that one day I'm going to work in this reserve, and it's true, now I'm working here. The poachers are destroying our nature. Because most of the jobs come from tourism, agriculture and stuff like that. Even the money that we are earning come from tourism and agriculture. So once the poachers are killing all those animals, I don't think I will still become a mamba. Just because there is nothing that I'm supposed to take care of them. As I am from the community, and the poachers are people from the communities who want money in an easy way. But I don't hate them because I know that they think it's the only way to survive. Those people need education. They need somebody to help them to, to realize that uh, poaching is not a good thing and poaching is not good for them because immediately they find you. Uh, let's say it happens you were found with people who've got weapons, they're going to kill you. And your kids will be left with like orphans and your wife will, not ha will, will no longer have a husband. So when I see the poachers, I feel like those people need somebody to teach them how to, to survive. And they also need somebody to help them to get a job so that they can stop uh, rhino poaching. I see a poacher as a human being because they are a human being. They are just greedy people. But they need uh, knowledge to stop what they are doing. You get scenarios where somebody with just local people would get bribed or whatever to try and kill a rhino. But the majority of these guys that, that, that poach now is ex-soldiers and they've got nothing to lose. They come from other countries, but they've got nothing to lose. They, they know the hardships of life and um, they, they fear nothing. And they're not scared to work at night and, and be in the reserves amongst the lions and the other animals. And our, our poaching guys need to be careful because these guys will shoot if there's a problem. Poachers are now putting IEDs, improvised explosive devices on game trails on random portions of the bush, if not for the anti-poaching, to simply blow the leg of the elephant, incapacitating it and making it a lot easier to remove the ivory. With the threat of an IED, with the threat of an, of an unseen sort of ghost that lurks below your feet, slows you down and messes with the guy's heads a lot. Having a dog that is trained and the, conf the, the handler has the confidence to use the dog in that situation to, to, to detect a potentially explosive device is a great peace of mind for the handler. It's, it's, it's organized crime. It's not just subsistence poaching anymore. When humans start to use natural resources for illegal means, the only people that benefit are the criminals. Um, and when criminals have power, uh, life becomes very miserable for not just thousands of people, but sometimes millions of people. Um, and that responsibility, I think, is not something that is, you know, quarantined in Africa now, that the implications of terrorism are spilling out all over the world. So it's something that I think every human on this planet needs to take responsibility for now. A, a lot of places have learned a lot from what happened at Tula Tula. And they're not the only facility that has been attacked. Um, but in their case, um, poachers came in, um, they beat up the staff, tied them up, um, assaulted them. The brutality of poaching uh, causes humans to become less and less humane. Uh, I think it starts off with, with the poachers themselves and what drives them to just do these horrendous things to animals. But even um, the good guys, even the people that are kind of on my side of the fence who get called to these incidences, we can feel how every time we get exposed to it, we become harder and harder and our levels of frustration eventually turn to anger and resentment. And you know, who knows what we would do if we were put in a situation where we came across poachers doing that 
to animals, we'd, we'd probably turn into animals ourselves. Um, and so, you know, the tragedy of this whole issue is how inhumane humans have become. Education is the only thing that can decrease rhino poaching. Because if we fight and all these things, we're all coming from the same community, we're all human beings. So we need to educate each other and put our boots in the ground and then we can stop uh, this rhino poaching. Wow. Even though I've, I've seen this documentary before, it moved me just as much, um, if not more, I think this time around. The, the Kleenex were definitely brought out. So I'm um, looking forward to the discussion and any questions, those of you attending either here on Zoom or the YouTube live stream um, might have. Uh, we have 20 additional attendees on YouTube live. So if, even though you're not on Zoom, still feel free to ask questions and we will ask them here. As folks are contemplating and formulating their own questions and commentary in the chat boxes, I will just get us started with a question for, for all of you, for all of the researchers and, and um, who created this documentary. I was wondering if you've gained feedback from viewers living within the geographic areas you were aiming to impact with this documentary. And if so, whether those reactions differ at all from what any of you expected. I mean, I think it might be nice to start this discussion with with that and, and other findings that you think are important to, to share with the viewers. Sure, so is that okay if I, I'll go first. Um, so yeah, we ended up, um, we did screenings with, um, because we wanted to focus on kind of student age group, a university student age group, um, and ideally focusing on people who came from countries where there was a tradition of uh, consumption of rhino horn products. Uh, we had a relatively limited sample size. Uh, we ended up doing um, quite detailed surveys with 54 uh, international students. And that involved us um, doing a pre-screening questionnaire, um, which 54 of them completed in full. Then they were randomly allocated one of the three films to watch. And then they did a post-screening questionnaire, um, which, <sighs> encouraged them to revisit some of their questions that they'd answered prior to the film. And we were, we were wanting to find out the impact of the films on their affective states, so their emotional reaction to the films, but also whether the films impacted on whether they thought rhino horn consumption was acceptable or not, um, and just kind of more general knowledge about how rhino horn was procured and um, the impacts of, of poaching on rhinos and so on. So um, in addition to the surveys, we also did 14 in-depth interviews with students. Um, so we had a, a comparatively okay sample size, given that it was quite a niche group that we were trying to, to target. And I think we've been quite over, oh, I, I don't wanna speak for everyone else, but certainly I've been quite overwhelmed by the responses to both the surveys and the interviews that unanimously um, the students 
experienced negative affective states after watching the films. And so, I mean, a, a very basic definition of grief is um, some kind of uh, emotional response to a loss and um, the fact that uh, descriptors that they used included things like sad or angry or some of them used the term grief explicitly um, but also some felt uh, angry uh, uneasy disgusted frustrated but given the emphasis of Van Doren's mm -hmm. concept of storied mourning um, on trying to implicate others in um, in the situation to try and uh, make them feel culpable for environmental crisis or for the loss of non-human life. What was particularly, I guess, not gratifying, that's the wrong word, but encouraging in terms of the success of the film was that 20% of those student uh, respondents used terms like shame and guilt. So terms that clearly linked their affective state with some kind of sense of culpability after watching the film. So I, I guess generally um, across the board, there have been these, these kind of negative emotional responses in ways that are positive for what we were trying to achieve. Um, yeah, and it, I, I don't know if anyone else wants to, to come in. There are a couple of really important examples. I think two participants um, had consumed rhino horn in the past and their responses were obviously particularly uh, in, informative and important. Uh, I think we'd been hoping to have more participants who had consumed rhino horn or who'd known people who consumed rhino horn products, but, um, but yeah, and, and obviously there's always the issue with, with this kind of research that um, people maybe didn't feel comfortable disclosing if they had consumed rhino horn products. Um, but yeah, of the two people who had consumed rhino horn in the past, uh, one had said how prior to watching the films that it was something that they um, would in, would do again in the future um, if, if the need arose, so for kind of curative purposes. But then after watching the film, their response became very negative about the process and that it was cruel and absolutely not. And they wouldn't want, I can't remember, I've got written down um, the, the, their specific response, but um, but yeah, I thought that was, again, given the aim of the project, that was really significant. So I don't know if anyone else wants to come in. I don't want to hog discussion. Okay, yeah, uh, thank you for sharing that. It's always really interesting to hear what's what's come of this documentary with that, that specific aim that you all had for it, so. Um, did anyone else have anything that you wanted to contribute to that before we move on? Um, we had uh, Don write, bravo, good film, um, no more words needed. So I feel like that's probably a reaction from a lot of folks that it's just, it has such an impact on you that <clears throat> you might be a bit stunned for a little bit while afterwards. Um, we also had Silas write on YouTube that every viewing of this documentary I've had has compounded the grief, anger, and general emotionality I experience while watching. Very powerful piece. That's not to say it's a negative thing, of course. I think it is just very effective at using a narrative to hold space and create impactful um, meditation on the issue. And so I'm going to, um, I see Farouk, so th nice to see you here as well, if you want to unmute. I've unmuted, right? Thanks. Hi, Tiamat. Um, great video, I mean, great documentary. Of course, there's very little else that one could in fact say or even want to say. Um, and I, I, I was kind of caught betwixt and between. Um, and part of it was around any documentary made in this area would become political. And I think probably in the room, I don't want to overstate it, I may be the only person possibly, there may be others who have actually darted rhinos in the Kruger, put my arms up their butts for samples, uh, formed a relationship with the rhino in Botswana. And of course, as you know, just a couple of weeks ago, came back from a place where I took photographs of a 
Dowager Rhino and then was told that I couldn't put them up because it was unsafe. So what are some of the other conflicting emotions that I had? Um, I, th I felt that in the initial part of the documentary, I was finding myself getting angry, not about the subject matter, but about the fact that all the people I was looking at who were talking about the rhinos did not look like me. They looked more like you, Tiamat. And they looked more like people um, who are either not looking like me or darker than I am. And that's our majority population here. And often the term poachers implies dark hued people. And that becomes the thing that folk from the global north and the West tend to then judge folk on. So the various vets who are involved in the massacre of rhinos are not touched on. And they really are ultimately the, the villains of the peace and not just the villains, the organizers of the massacres. The term poaching is really loaded and good or bad, it's fine, I can be neutral on that. Um, the other thing is also, I mean, the, 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 the basis of any of wildlife documentaries and particularly in relations to elephants and lions and giraffe and rhino, uh, what tends to happen is the side of what those animals mean to people from my continent, I'm South African, does not come through. And it's not a matter of conservation. It's a matter of living in concert with these other sentients. And often that doesn't come around. So I appreciated the fact that Sam put into context what the film was about, where it was intended to, in fact, engage with people in an audience. But I'm still a little bit unraveled by it. And I'm still a little bit discombobulated in that I'm hoping that there's another step and another step. And in those steps, more of the people from my continent are actually brought in. In fact, there's a whole lot of them playing. About, well, of course, part of the documentary did cover those folk, but they were covered in a subservient way, not in terms of the ones leading. And there are people who are leading. I mean, Ian Player, who is well known, was well known for rhino conservation and protection, his right-hand person and the person who did most of the work there was the Zulu man from Zululand. And often those folk get um, invisibilized. And so getting the message through to the folk who may or may not be active in the area doesn't always come through. And then yes, those who have a political agenda will then um, hijack that particular uh, uh, discussion, event, documentary, maybe like I'm doing now, sorry. But those are my views. But I really, from when I go back and kind of take on my neutral position of just looking at the content of the documentary, I thought it was really phenomenal and there was huge bonding with the sentience in them. So thank you to all the filmmakers and those were just my observations. Sorry, I've gone on a bit. So thank you. Thanks, Diamond. Any of you have? Okay, Andrea, I see you. Yeah, thank you very much for those comments. And, you know, obviously these have been concerns for us. And to be honest, when we, uh, when we arrived in South Africa, this was one of the things that stuck out to us, you know, that, you know, we, we were making this film and a lot of the sort of vets, as you say, these kind of peoples in sort of higher positions were white. Um, obviously, this is South Africa, and there's, it's the first time I've been to South Africa, and there are uh, racial divisions there still. Uh, but as you say, there are you know people leading the way uh, that aren't necessarily white. But it wasn't necessarily the frame that we kind of went in. Uh, how can we say it was something we kind of learned along the way uh, that this is this is how the film kind of. Uh, um sort of uh, on the ground so to speak this is what we found on the ground and these were the people we had contacted and these were the people we had connections with uh, and this is kind of what happened um and throughout the filming process this was something we discussed um but it was there 
you know, it was something we kind of uh, were in the locations that we'd actually been able to schedule and shoot. Uh, however, the last film, there is more of a present, but presence, but yes, as you say, uh, they're not maybe in sort of terms of hierarchy. Um, uh, they're not in the sort of higher position, but we kind of felt that actually we would need to spend a lot more time in the field uh, to do uh, a more um, sort of in tune local uh, take, if you like, or more uh, in depth sort of view uh, of the situation. And also in terms of unpacking the term or the uh, uh, poaching, you know, as you say, it's a very loaded term. Uh, these we, we don't refer to poachers, you know, the people we interviewed refer to poachers, but you're right. I mean, this, you could, you know, um, it could have uh, racial undertones or, or they refer to people in the community. When they say community, they mean the black community. So, you know, there are these kinds of nuances, if you like, that were, <coughs> excuse me, emerging as we were shooting. And uh, we kind of discussed, actually, that we would uh, perhaps like to do another project to explore these more intricate relations uh, in terms of race and politics as well. But, uh, but yeah, absolutely. The, this was a fantastic point to make and something we've tried to work with as we've gone along uh, in the process. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. A really insightful comments and questions. And as someone who's done field work in South Africa um, in relation to other kind of human wildlife conflict issues, I, it was something that I was also concerned about. But as Andrew said, we had a, a kind of a, a limited period within which to do the field work and quite a limited budget also. And um, and and I don't I, I don't want it to sound like a cop out, but ultimately the 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 kind of the aim, the agenda of the film um, was about trying to connect viewers from the other side of the world um, with the plight of the, the rhinos. And had it been a, a, a traditional ethnographic film, an anthropological film, then we would have wanted to unpack all of these racial and political issues and um, we would have done it very differently but because we had that very clear brief um, we were more concerned with kind of trying to find examples that helped us to tell the story that we needed to tell um, for this particular project but absolutely I think um, I think we'd all be very keen to to revisit that and and kind of correct some of the omissions that we had to make because of the constraints of the funding and the the brief that we were working to, um, I don't know, Kate or Fennell or Alex, if you wanted to add anything. No, I think you've covered it well, Sam and Andrew. Just. Yeah, thank you for all of your responses. We have on YouTube, Animals Amplified asked, um, I know poachers often do not have their basic needs met, which makes it hard for them to care about rhinos who apparently do have their needs met. Any, re any research on how this method would affect those types of audiences? Um. If I just come in briefly, so again, yeah, the the whole um, the predicaments of the poachers as a category or those involved in in kind of fueling the or supplying the demand for rhino horn, um, we again we weren't able to feature that side of things in the research and in the film. We were. And it's a criticism that we've encountered, particularly from anthropological audiences, when we've screened this at academic conferences, where the audiences are mostly anthropologists or environmental humanities scholars. That, um, yeah, the, the 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 criticism of why aren't we giving the poachers a voice, or um, we're privileging, I guess, in many respects, the 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 grief and the suffering of uh, privileged white folks who. Are lucky enough to live on reserves and care for these rhinos um, but again it was uh, th these were really these are incredibly complex issues and we did have this particular brief that we wanted viewers who were 
from communities where rhino horn was consumed, not from communities where the rhino horn was obtained. And so, again, from um, from kind of talks talking with anthropologists and others who work in these different communities, the the sense or the feeling was that they perhaps wouldn't really be so moved or concerned about the predicaments of the poachers. And it, and it, and so it was it was something that we. I mean, in the text at the opening of the film that we, we kind of clarified that we weren't able to speak for all of the different stakeholders or give them a voice or or, or representation within the, the films that we had, a, again, I sound like a broken record, but we had this particular agenda and um, aim that we wanted to achieve. And so so the narrative was very much focused on on on, on that. Yeah, I'll just add as well, um that the people who poach rhinos are not even close to being a homogenous group in themselves. As the film sort of touched on, you have people who live in local communities, uh, you have that end of the spectrum all the way to these really um, powerful international groups um, and these paramilitary actors who come in to poach as well. So even if we'd been in some sort of position to try to represent the poaching side of things, um, the, the perspective of the person who's poaching the rhino, it would always have been a very limited um, and restricted perspective because it wouldn't, we couldn't possibly have, um, we couldn't possibly have shown the experience of the poacher because they're just not a homogenous group. There's all kinds of people with all kinds of motivations. Um, and yeah, as, as my colleagues have said, it wasn't our remit, but there is also that to consider. Yeah, did anyone else have anything they'd, they had any thoughts on that? Oops, sorry, I have a dog with a phone on his head. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I have a question as well for Dr. Mitchell, because um, sort of with, with the aim of this documentary um, being to have this impact, and it really is so intense and emotional, I'm really curious, yeah, to hear more about how that affected your decision sort of while you guys were there and filming, like how you chose to approach things or how you then chose to edit it later on. I mean, for example, just the choice to start it with this black screen and the cries that can really just trigger such a powerful emotional response uh, for viewers. I mean, I'm speaking on my own behalf, but I, I think I've noticed that a bit as well, that it has that strong impact. So I'd be curious to hear more about your decisions around filming and editing with that impact in mind. Yeah, thank you. It's a good question, actually. Uh, I mean, you know, the brief was obviously for the film to be uh, emotional and to be effective. Um, and it really started taking shape uh, on the ground, actually, to be honest. We didn't have a shot list or uh, we didn't have a, any sort of specific aims. You know, it was a very ethnographic film in that way, uh, in terms of we, we went to where we went and uh, into the field and sort of uh, interviewed people and met people. And, um, and actually, with all the different sites we were going to, Bella's name came up a few times and it was sort of she started sort of taking over and obviously we had this uh, storied morning approach uh, which Sam was um, uh, sort of pushing for initially and so she became the kind of main protagonist if you like uh, very naturally um, and people had connected with her so it seemed like she was a good vehicle uh, for us to kind of uh, work with um, and when we met uh, her carer she actually um, sent us a clip, uh, this uh, video. Uh, I think it was quite early on, actually, in the shoot, if I remember correctly. Uh, and and I remember watching it, and it was just it was just an audio clip, actually. It's a video clip, but it was so dark. I think that there there was no uh, you couldn't see anything. Uh, it was just audio that you could hear, and it was a very powerful had a very powerful effect on me. Um, just this uh, pure audio. And we, we discussed that uh, everyone was the same, you know, um, we were just Kate uh, and Fenella who were in the field. Um, and uh, we discussed over dinner and said, yeah, we should open with this. You know, this is, you know, we're, we're trying to, as ethnographic filmmakers now, we're experimenting more and more with the senses and how we can kind of invoke other senses apart from sight and how other senses, uh, well, particularly sound, can um, 
uh, arouse emotions uh, in a powerful way. So uh, we felt that this would be a good way to open the film. And really it was Bella's story anyway, um, what it was all about, you know, this powerful bond, you know, with the, uh, the, with the sort of baby and mother uh, being broken uh, and a kind of sort of almost a trans-specific emotion, you know, that, an emotion that crosses species boundaries um, and has that kind of powerful effect. And I think emotions actually probably have that ability. You know, we always think of humans as being the only sort of emotional animal, but that's far from the case. And I think this film shows that and the experience in the field definitely has illustrated that. So this was with the sound, we wanted to evoke that, uh, but also as I was filming, I was paying particular attention to the uh, interviewee's emotions, their, their sort of voice, if it would change, you know, could pick up on uh, sort of emotional uh, responses coming up and then I'll try and zoom in and get closer to, to capture that. So it's kind of trying to be aware of these, uh, these things as you're filming, really. And you have to be fast, you know, sometimes. And, uh, and you have to have eyes in the back of your head and, you know, but obviously, you know, with Fenella and uh, Kate there, I mean, Fenella works miracles, actually, in some ways, you know, in terms of eliciting these emotional responses. And, you know, Kate as well, you know, leading the way with these uh, sort of trying to uh, situate uh, sort of emotive uh, uh, memories. So I think it was a team effort, really, in that way. And these things kind of just naturally evolved uh, and kind of rose to the surface as we were editing. So thank you. Could I just add a follow up point to, to that as well around the, the, the kind of the, the translatable uh, or the way in which emotions were translated? Because one of the concerns that we had when we were um, making the film and even just thinking through the rationale for the project was whether these emotions would be translatable cross-culturally. And I think, again, going back to the survey and interview responses that, that we've had, that it is a, these are universal, universally recognized um, emotions that all of the viewers who watched Bella's story, because um, obviously the survey participants didn't watch the whole film, they watched one of the three parts and all of those who watch Bella's story commented in some way or another on um, the empathy that they felt towards the, the grieving calf um, so that this was trans-species empathy as well as kind of cross-cultural empathy for the, the human grievers, mourners. So I think that's really, that's been again really a, an important aspect of the film because again thinking back to some of the anthropological conferences where we've shared the documentary previously that um, some suggestion that maybe viewers from other cultural contexts wouldn't uh, it have that kind of emotional connection to the subject matter and maybe again as I said we've had the sample sizes or the sample is potentially limiting in that these are uh, university international students coming to study at a at UK institutions so we had most of the responses came from Exeter students but we also um, cut, there was some snowball sampling where students passed on the survey to friends and acquaintances at other institutions um, and yeah that the so it might be that, that there is something there in that the students are kind of wanting to engage with um, uh, other ways of thinking or uh, being in the world but certainly across the different kind of cultural backgrounds of the viewers of the films it seems that these are quite universally recognized and experienced emotions thank you yeah it, is, it really does bring forth such strong emotions and i think oftentimes if we don't know how rhinos sound or even how rhinos sound in those moments it's without seeing you know, who is making these sounds. It, it's such an interesting way of starting the documentary. So I think that's really fascinating as well, um, that approach. But Stylus on YouTube asks, are there any plans for subsequent films in this project? So sort of a follow-up uh, discussion from the earlier questions, perhaps representing the poaching side of things, even if limited as Kate and Sam point out, would be worth grappling with, including caveats. Yeah, Alex. 
Um, I do, it, it, this, um, this issue, I think, as uh, everyone's already said, um, is something which came up very early on um, when just thinking about the project and what it's going to be. Um, both the issue of uh, the, the perspective of or the world of those who are responsible for the poaching, and then also the issue of uh, focusing on, uh, in the films, uh, at least in the first film, uh, you know, Muzungu on, on, on white folk and, uh, you know, the, the, the idea that that could um, suggest or that could perpetuate certain uh, views which are not necessarily uh, helpful or truthful. Um, I think that the latter issue um, is distinct. I think the, the first one that this, quest, this question relates to um, is, I mean, I would go so far as to say that I think it would be wrong to do that, uh, to make further films in that regard, looking from the poacher's perspective. Um, I And I, I'm not speaking for everyone here, but um, the the films are made with a very particular ethical stance that it is wrong to do this to, to rhinos, that, that, that it is not a good thing. Um, no doubt the people who are responsible and responsible in all sorts of ways, not just the people who commit the uh, acts of violence, as it were, but those who lead to the situations which make that an inviting uh, thing to do right um, all sorts of different levels of, respons of responsibility including those who consume the rhino horn um, but the question for me is um, what are we trying to do and where is respect due um, and I won't I won't go on and on and on but you know the the the, the um the sort of backbone of my trade is analogies and I won't, uh, yeah, I won't go on, but I, I suspect perhaps everyone here can cook up in their own minds, certain analogies that don't involve rhino, perhaps criminal organizations doing very unpleasant things to human beings, trafficking or whatever it might be. And then saying, don't you think we should get the perspective of those who are, committing the trafficking or don't you think we should get the perspective of the murderers or whatever the case may be no doubt they do have rich and troubling and uh, important backgrounds in many ways and there are politi there's politics and economics behind these crimes but nevertheless giving attention to and focusing very much on the victims is an important ethical uh impetus it's 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 a responsibility i think to emphasize the victims as opposed to those who are responsible um yeah i, I just thought i'd say that thank you yeah that was a really um insightful addition to the, that whole conversation i think it's such an important element to to think about as well um we have from jess on youtube uh, they wrote, hi all, thank you so much for sharing this project. I found the film very powerful. I was wondering if you could explain a bit more about the students you were serving and why this age demographic? Sure, shall I, is it okay if, <laughs> if I go? Because then um, I've, uh, yeah, for various reasons, I wasn't able to actually go to South Africa on that occasion to do the field work. So I've kind of taken the lead with the, the follow-up research and um, doing all the interviews with the students and creating and distributing the survey and the screenings and so on. And um, the reason that we wanted to target that particular age group was because of the recognition that um, I think it was Millican and Shaw um, arguing that uh, young kind of party goers this kind of is it kind of generation Z or, or millennials um, being the kind of increasing demographic um, so while they'd profiled the your average rhino horn consumer as a kind of an af a a businessman in his 40s that actually um, there was the, the, the 
expectation that that would change as a result of the change in use of the the rhino horn product um, and its kind of integration within youth culture in novel ways. Um, so I think perhaps because uh, I, I mean that the, it seemed like we couldn't uh, we couldn't meaningfully target with the, the 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 project had to be quite limited bounded by the the constraints of the funding it wasn't a massive amount of funding that we were awarded and so we had to to kind of be realistic in what we were able to achieve and so in an ideal world we'd have looked at trying to create films to target all of these different consumer groups and to some extent we did create the three films to try and do that a little bit so babies recognizing as Millican and Shaw uh, said that kind of pa parents, mothers will use rhino horn for their, their children. Um, and we also developed the, the kind of the brief for guardians because of the, the kind of status symbol and the, um, the kind of social and political prestige around perhaps a more macho culture that we thought potentially that that kind of narrative might feed into that particular potential consumer group. But overall, we wanted to try and target um, this emergent consumer group. And um, it was partly convenience. The project started just at the start of the COVID pandemic. So we were able to access students at the university with ease. Um, the university has a very large international student population with students from all of the countries where um, rhino horn has been documented as a traditional uh, kind of commodity. Um, so yeah, that was the, the kind of the primary motivation for it, uh, for that particular emphasis. So sorry, that's a bit waffly. <laughs> no, not at all. I I love hearing all about about these things that's going on in the in the in the process of creating a documentary like this and and how the impact is, is had as well. Um, Marion from Zoom uh, had a question and uh, they wrote, first watch my response was similar to that from Farouk. On second viewing, I wondered about the silence of the editors slash interviewers, especially when the vet talked about his potential to become hardened and animal. Does this messaging, uh, in parentheses, human animal exceptionalism, dilute the work to induce empathy? foregrounding the voice of the bereaved rhino was so powerful. Uh, I'll, I'll attempt uh, that uh, answer in there, actually. Uh, I think, you know, humans are contradictory, you know, and this is probably one of the most interesting things looking at human-animal relations. And um, when, when we were editing that, you know, uh, I kind of thought, oh, it, there's a contradiction there does it work does it not work and actually you know as a social anthropologist and you know all the field work i do actually contradictions are where all the interesting things happen actually uh, you know this is how humans try to balance things uh, in in our sort of social universes if you like so yeah i don't think it does dilute it actually i think it says a lot um and you know some animals are more human to humans than others you know uh, and it depends where you position yourself. Uh, you know the uh, you know the vet here. He, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure he's not a vegetarian. You know he probably would quite happily uh, have a barbecue out in the veranda there while talking about uh, you know saving rhinos. Uh, so you know, of course, there are all kinds of contradictions, and it depends on the context. Um, so yes, you're right. It's interesting that this kind of comes up. Uh, and it makes you think about what it means to be human and what it means to be animal. And um, yeah, these are important questions. So thank you for, for noticing that. Thank you. Super, thank you, Andrew. Can I just add a follow on point from that as well? Because I think, again, we also wanted to, um, to try and present, obviously we wanted to, to create this kind of grief or this emotional response but we wanted we were recognizing that everyone watching the film might come at it from different backgrounds different uh be motivated by different things and so having the both the the kind of the the patrols the security patrols the paramilitaries the vets talking in a 
less emotive and perhaps more anthropocentric way about their experiences and their motivations for protecting rhino, again, we hoped might engage a more wider audience than, than just those who were sad about the, the babies being orphaned. Thank you. Did anyone else want to, to contribute something to that? Or I thought I didn't want to cut anyone off if they had something to share. I suppose it might be worth, I mean, I guess it's already been said really, but just to, at the risk of being redundant, I just thought that it might almost be counter to what we were trying to do to make a film that was explicitly abolitionist or, or, or liberationist, um, that the, the audience is to who if if we were there's no need to appeal to that audience uh to say you know rhino poaching is bad they already think it's it's bad <laughs> um by definition uh it, yeah we, we had to try and strike a tone where we were getting into the thoughts and, and feelings of people who yeah who, who were on the fence right <laughs> which is a a, a, a a weird place to try and pitch an idea but yeah Can I just, again, follow on from that? I was going to just read a, a quote from one of the interviewees. Um, so he, uh, he said, I always knew that there was this kind of poaching going on, but I didn't know how bad it was and how cruel it was. And these, these films show us how it's done and how they die in a terrible way. So it makes me pity them. And so, again, there wasn't that, that when we looked at the descriptors that the key words that people were using to describe their emotional reaction to the films there were some that were sad and embarrassed and um, guilty and angry but there were others who were expressing it in terms like pity which was almost kind of patronizing and and so from my reading of their responses that that human exceptionalist kind of way of thinking was more in line with their way of thinking but um, that that, that they maybe wouldn't have engaged with the films had it just been Bella and Babies without the, the kind of the Guardian's bit at the end or without the narratives from some of those participants who were, yeah, more detached or more anthropocentric. I don't know what the others think. Yeah. That's just me. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for all of the insight that you guys are sharing about this. Um, there's a lot of really, really lovely comments that I'm not going to, to, to read out necessarily, but if anyone has any more questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And in the meantime, I'll just very selfishly ask one of my own that I've been <laughs> holding on to that I'd love to hear your thoughts on. I'm curious, uh, you know, to what extent or even whether um, the veterinarian and the caretakers in general address sort of this ability to sustain the work that they're doing because it is so intense and like they say this is something that they're doing 24 7 um you know witnessing this such devastation and being traumatized repeatedly by by the states of these rhinos um i mean i'm just curious if they have support to deal with this type of i guess you know ptsd and is there a way that they kind of proactively prevent emotional exhaustion and burnout for example or is that just way too utopian to be thinking about that when you have so much going on Um, I think that it's quite a tight-knit small community or at least the people that we spoke to a lot of them knew each other and referenced each other um, and I get the impression that really the way they deal with it is by feeling like they're on the same team and they can talk to each other about it and um, you know there is this sense that people who don't look after rhinos all day every day aren't really ever going to fully understand their experience. Um, nobody mentioned, as far as I recall, seeing like a professional therapist or um, having help of that kind, but they just talked about talking with each other. And also the thing that I noticed was um, all of them, including Will, the vet, uh, were actually quite comfortable in showing their emotions about it to us. So it didn't seem like a case of feeling lots of emotion and trying to bottle it up or trying to present it in a acceptable presentable kind of package they were really quite open with 
their feelings. Um, and I guess sort of my reading of that is that helps them, you know, to keep going. But also, yeah, they're all, a lot, a lot of them are like really shattered and tired and they fully admitted being really tired all the time um, and sometimes feeling hopeless and sometimes feeling energized and, you know, being able to save one rhino would keep them going for a certain amount of time. So, um, but yeah, I think it's the, my main impression is they get through because they feel like they have others on their side and they're not alone. I don't know if anyone else wanted to add. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, if anyone else wanted to. Uh, I can just add briefly. Um, I, I was surprised actually at how uh, open they were with their emotions. Uh, having worked uh, in Sweden with uh, wolf hunting and the wolf hunting issue, um, working with uh, every sort of uh, uh, spectrum, if you or the whole sort of uh, field, if you like. Um, yeah, but maybe Sweden's a different context, so it's not good to compare. But I think you're right. Um, uh, you know, I think it's, they, they were relying on each other uh, and they do rely on each other. But I think it's worth emphasizing the dangers here. And, and it does come out in uh, the last film, uh, Guardians, but th these are really very dangerous situations that they're working in. Um, and, uh, you know, that's something that they have to live with on a daily basis when you have something so valuable they're just grazing in the field, you know, um, and uh, it's, uh, I, you know, I was kind of impressed with their, their bravery, uh, to be honest, and their sort of, um, and their focus. Uh, so for me, that was something that really came across. And, you know, the emotion was just there. I mean, we, you know, we went to, to capture this and to, well, this is what we wanted to do, but it was just, it was kind of overwhelming, actually, uh, to be honest. Um, so in that respect, it was kind of not easy, but it was just, you know, we were just recording, uh, you know, as, as people spoke. So, um, it was a highly emotive sort of situation, I think. Thanks. Yeah, I can only imagine, um, for the caretakers and also for, for all of you who are there sort of documenting that and discussing that, uh, before we wrap up this really wonderful event. Um, I wanted to ask, you know, how can attendees and, and folks who watch this replay on YouTube, how can they support your, your efforts with this? Um, whether that's sharing a link, I saw that Farouk uh, wrote in the Zoom chat. Um, we have a link there as well for the documentary if anyone wants to, to watch the original, so to speak. Um, is there any other way that folks can support this and that, that effort that you have that you want? Sure. Uh, yeah, thank you. I mean, we did have, given that Vietnam is the largest consumer base for Rhino Horn, we have had all the films translated into Vietnamese. So if anyone does have access to Vietnamese audiences, then we'd be very happy to share the subtitled versions also. But yeah, I think certainly from my perspective, just sharing the films as widely as possible would be really helpful. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if any of the others had any further suggestions, but equally getting your feedback because uh, we wanted to screen the films with very particular audiences, but we've had so much really helpful and constructive feedback from audiences that we hadn't originally intended to show the films to. So the, the more feedback that we can get on, um, of, you know, in an ideal world, we'd get more funding to do some kind of follow-up projects and maybe um, as Farouk had um, suggested, you know, kind of explore um, the, the, the diversity within the rhino conservation community in Southern Africa. And um, yeah, so whatever feedback you have um, would be really great. Thank you so much. Yeah, did um, any of you have any concluding remarks that you'd like to leave people with? I know that we haven't heard from Fenella, which is, which is fine. I just don't want you to feel excluded. Um, so if anyone, before I sort of wrap this up, if there's anything you'd like to leave the attendees with. Otherwise, we can wrap it up. <laughs> um, but yes, in any case, I, I just really wanted to thank you, you all very much, um, you know, for, for coming and, and sharing 
the documentary for you know the discussion that it brought forth and for all of your really insightful answers. And of course, thank you, of course, to, to all of you who are attending and thank you for being here with us today. Uh, it really was a pleasure and I hope that you all enjoyed it and that you share it with, with everyone you know, especially your Vietnamese friends as, as Sam mentioned. And please feel welcomed also to visit the Animals and Biodiversity Think Tank programs, Facebook group and Twitter, as well as the Ease Working Groups, um, Facebook and Twitter as well, of course, to keep up to date with all of this. And you will find some links to, the, to that in the chat as well. Um, you'll also find a link to the Think Tank program's website, which is hosted by the Global Research Network. So please do take a moment to, to look at that and the other Think Tank programs and consider becoming a member as well. And I hope to see you again at our future events. Thank you and have a really good evening or morning, wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you all very much. Been great. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.